Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Griffin. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations at Fordham University. Tonight, the topic, of course, is uh, brand loyalty. And now I want to uh, introduce our distinguished speakers, Drs. Lerzan Axoy and Tim Kiningham. Lerzan is a professor of marketing at the Fordham Gabelli School of Business. Her research interests include consumer satisfaction and its relationship to customer loyalty and firm performance, customer relationship management, and managing customers as assets. She will present with Dr. Tim Cunningham, the Global Chief Strategy Officer at Ipsos, the world's leading professional services firm dedicated exclusively to customer experience, satisfaction, and loyalty. They're also co-authors of the new book, The Wallet Allocation Rule, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and we'll have it available for purchase and signing at the conclusion of the program. So uh, please uh, listen attentively, ask good questions, and purchase a copy of the, uh, of the book on your way out. <laughs> please welcome Lerzan and Tim. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, it's truly a big pleasure to be here um, with Tim. And um, as Michael said, we're going to be talking about our new book, The Wallet Allocation Rule. It actually came out February 9th. Uh, of this year, so very, very recent. And as Michael said, we promise to sign it uh, if you do happen to have a copy of it. So um, Tim is actually going to start off, and then we're just going to go back and forth. And at the end, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, the reason we work so well together is we're a husband and wife team. <laughs> yeah. I, that's right. You're all, uh, she's smart, as you can tell from the bio, so I'm the pretty one. <laughs> and uh, the. <laughs> I'm sticking to it. <laughs> the, uh, but we do need to thank a few other people. Uh, before we get uh, started, I do want to thank Luke Williams and Alexander Buey, who are our co authors on this book. Uh, Luke worked with me at Ipsos. Alex also worked with me at Ipsos until very recently when Lerzon stole him to become a professor at the Gabelli School of Business, which was a huge loss for me, but uh, uh, a great win for Fordham, and he loves being at Fordham. It was a dream. Uh, we also need to thank uh, uh, Bruce Coyle. The wallet allocation rule was actually introduced in the Harvard Business Review, and Bruce Coyle was my statistics professor when I got my MBA at Vanderbilt a few years ago quite a few years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and one last person we need to thank is Sunil Gupta uh, at the Harvard Business School. Uh, the, the other part of the underpinning of the book actually appeared in the uh, 2014 MIT Sloan Management Review. And we owe, uh, we owe Sunil a great deal. Sunil uh, at the time was the head of the marketing faculty at the Harvard Business School. Uh, but he also wrote the letter to the editors at the Harvard Business Review saying, hey, this is a really important publication. You need to pay attention to it, because if that didn't happen, we wouldn't have been in. Uh, so uh, we are very, very fortunate that we're surrounded by such wonderful people to help us. Now, why do we need the wallet allocation rule? Well, it turns out that uh, companies have decided that it's really hard to compete on product features, or price, or whatever they're going to call their relevant value proposition. Uh, because it turns out that there isn't that much difference between most of the main brands in a category. So they decided that really what they want to do is compete on how you feel about the entire experience. Now, that sounds like a really good strategy. It's also a really hard strategy. Now, Part of the problem that makes this hard is that they have to understand what you want, which is why you end up in your inbox, assuming that you're on email, with whatever you do, getting a survey to annoy you. By the way, we do a lot of these surveys at my company, and we're not trying to annoy you. But what happens is you get overloaded with these things, and they really want you to give them feedback. Everyone thinks, no, they don't really pay attention. They actually pay a lot of attention. People are compensated based on how you respond to that survey. You, your, your bonus may be tied to it. It may, may go all the way up to a senior executive. The president may actually get a percentage of his compensation based on the scores you guys give. 
The reason they do this is they have this belief that if these numbers go up, so will their share price because they will grow as a company. So you can go to any of the Fortune 500 annual reports and you can be almost virtually assured you will see something that says, here's my customer satisfaction score, or they might call it their net promoter score, which is just a derivative of satisfaction. Basically, they ask you, how likely are you to recommend the firm? By the way, these are highly correlated variables. So you get basically the same answer. And they think that if these scores hit to a certain level, they're going to hit a growth spurt. They, and by the way, there's a, there's, there, the reason they believe that is there are some articles that tell them that this is going to happen. I'm not saying they're truthful articles that tell them this is going to happen, because there is an unfortunate reality. And the unfortunate reality is this. It's really, really hard to link any of these customer satisfaction or net promoter or whatever metric you're tracking to firm financial performance. This isn't my analysis. This is one that appeared in Bloomberg Business Week. And it resulted in an article called Proof That It Pays to Be America's Most Hated Corporations. <laughs> what they did was they looked at the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And I know you guys don't, don't look for that measure, but that's actually a measure that comes out of the University of Michigan and it looks at, I guess, about 85% of the gross domestic product of this company. And they look and they say, well, how, are, how satisfied are people with the different firms that they're buying from? And what they were doing was they were saying, well, let's look at the scores that these people are giving to these firms and let's look at the stock performance. And what we actually see is a negative relationship in this very simple way that they did the analysis. Now, I don't want to suggest that this is the way an academic would do the analysis, but it's the way a manager would likely do the analysis. And they end up finding out that you don't get what you expect. You get a negative relationship. And I loved the line in the article, your contempt truly doesn't matter. It actually might, pay, it might hurt the form, firm's performance to try to make you happy. It was so unexpected that my hero, <laughs> Stephen Colbert, had one of the funniest <laughs> scenes in his history, which is really saying something for Stephen Colbert. And uh, he, w he went through uh, this unexpected finding of, negative, uh, of a negative relationship between satisfaction and firm performance. And he actually offered his help to get America's corporation scores right down in the toilet. I can't repeat some of the measures because it is a Jesuit institution we're talking to. But they were very funny. <laughs> so why doesn't satisfaction lead to firm performance? Well, we're going to go through three primary reasons that we find. And the first one is what we call money losing delighters. We'll explain what all these mean in just a minute, but I'm going to kind of just prepare you for what we're going to go through in, a sec in our sections. The next one, something you won't be expecting, smaller, often equals happier. And the last one, our measures actually don't link to customer behavior at all. So if they don't link to customer behavior, it's really hard to roll that up into firm performance. Now I'm going to turn it over to Lerzan to walk us through money losing delighters. So what do we mean when we say money losing delighters? I actually want to explain what this is with an example. An example probably that many of us are familiar with, Groupon. Um, Groupon uh, is sold to merchants as a way to get the customers in through the door with the hopes that they will keep coming back and become lifetime customers. However, when you look at Groupon's customers and 50% of the deals that are the most popular deals and the most high satisfaction deals, they're actually the ones that have the lowest profitability. So, and that's not just looking at one specific transaction. It turns out that uh, profitability doesn't work even over the lifetime of those customers because you're essentially actually um, going for customers who are deal prone and those are not the ones who are actually going to come back. So the Groupon case is a great example of what we mean by money losing delighters. The second example I want to talk about is Home Bank. And you may not be familiar with Home Bank, but it used to be a very large mortgage company. And the reason you may know Home Bank is because it was featured in this book called The Ultimate Question, where net promoter score was, was introduced. 
And it was featured in this book as a case study of a company that has one of the highest net promoter scores in an industry that is characterized by net promoter scores of about 3%. So Home Bank had 80% net promoter scores. So how did net Home Bank achieve this? Uh, Home Bank wanted to increase their customer satisfaction ratings. And what they did was they tied customer complaints to employee performance and recognition and reward systems. So anytime a customer would complain about an employee or about a situation, that employee would be reprimanded. And not only that, they would also lose their bonus. And if this happened twice, the employee would lose their job. So if you're a home bank employee, you're going to be doing everything in your power to make sure your customers are happy. Now the problem is, in a mortgage business, the thing that determines your happiness is loan approval. And so most of the employees started approving loans. And that didn't go over well for home bank. So by 2006, when this was introduced in the ultimate question, they started uh, losing lots of money financially. And by 2007, they actually filed for bankruptcy. So um, the home bank name actually was bought by another company. Uh, so we're just hoping that they don't actually run into the same fate as, as the prior home bank. So this is a great example. Home bank and Groupon are two great examples of what we mean by money losing delighters. So the easiest way to keep your customers happy is actually to reduce your price or even better, give your product away. But I think we all would agree that that's not really a very good business strategy, right? So what's the solution to money losing delighters? The solution that we've proposed in the MIT Sloan Management Review um, is this framework. There is really no substitute for understanding customer profitability. So the idea is you really have to treat your customers as assets. It's a relationship. So um, sure, it's important that you satisfy your customers, but at the same time, they have to also be generating a reasonable rate of return for you. So you have to really see it in that context and balance and, and manage the relationship in that way. So the second problem is smaller often equals happier. Now, what do we mean by this? Smaller often equals happier. Uh, I want to demonstrate this again with another example of Kmart. Kmart in 2001 had the highest customer satisfaction rating in its entire history. If I were to ask you what happened in 2001 that Kmart was able to achieve this really high satisfaction rating, you probably wouldn't be able to guess what happened. They actually went bankrupt. They filed for bankruptcy. So uh, what was happening was uh, there were all these customers that were actually leaving Kmart. And the ones that remained were the core customer base of Kmart who loved Kmart. And so they were the ones who actually were rating Kmart very, very high. The reality is that we want to believe that customer satisfaction will result in growth. Right? And it makes a lot of sense. If customers like you, they're going to spend more with you, and that will result in greater market share. But the reality is actually quite different. When you look at the relationship between customer satisfaction and market share, it's actually not, the relationship is not exactly what we think it was going to be. Satisfaction, the higher the satisfaction level, the lower the market share. In fact, there's a lot of studies that show this and a lot of actually evidence out there when you look at industries. We see it all over the place, all over across industries, but we don't actually recognize it. Um, there are some um, probably exceptions to the rule, but if you look at fast food, for instance, we see that the high market share brands like McDonald's clearly have the lowest customer satisfaction ratings. You see the same thing in pizza restaurants, again, High share brands are the ones that have the lower customer satisfaction ratings. The same thing with discount retailers. Walmart, right? We're going to talk about the Walmart case. Uh, not exactly a high satisfaction brand. 
Life insurance companies, financial services, pretty much the same thing. We see it again and again and again. Um, with banks, in fact, when you look at the large banks, they're the lowest customer satisfaction brands. And the highest customer satisfaction brands are actually credit unions. Credit unions have by far the highest customer satisfaction rating across all industries in the United States. So some of you who may be credit union members may know why may, that may be the case. And I know a lot of credit union members who just love their credit unions. But unfortunately, that hasn't translated into market share. So why does that happen? We see this again all over, over and over again. Um, Klaus Fornell, who was the founder of the American Customer Satisfaction Index, looked at, before building the cu Customer Satisfaction Index in the United States, looked at firms in Sweden and found that there was no firm that had high customer satisfaction ratings that also had more than 30% market share. And after he brought the American Customer Satisfaction Index in, in, in the US, he found exactly the same thing. Um, this is a more recent study in 2013. Satisfaction and market share are strongly negatively linked. So this sounds very counterintuitive, right? I mean, that's not something that you would imagine would happen. So why does it happen? And that's really the question. Why it happens is, is probably not something you, you, would, um, you would think about. But I want you to imagine um, the food category. There are players that are more niche brands that focus on taste and being delicious. You know, an example that Tim likes is fried chicken, <laughs> right? So uh, foods that could kill you, they're so delicious, but they could kill you. Uh, then there are the healthy ones, right, that are really, really good for you, but may not necessarily be, be the best in taste. But again, they're very niche brands, and those customers that go for those brands, that's exactly what they're looking for. And then we have the mass brands, mass market brands in the middle. These brands are food brands that are not so flavorful that they'll kill you. But they're also <laughs> not so flavorless that you would rather die. So the, when you look at the customer base of these mass markets, they're really customers that, are, ha, that have much more diverse needs that are not being met as well as these niche brands on either side. And that's really the reason why this happens. And that's why we see these large mass market brands have lower customer satisfaction ratings as opposed to these smaller brands or niche brands. So now Tim is going to talk about what's the solution. It's not hopeless. All right, we're not saying uh, big brands should dissatisfy their customers. That, that uh, makes a great headline, but it's not real. What we're saying is you need to know what kind of brand you are. And there's really only four types of brands you can be. You can either be a mass market brand, think Walmart the greatest mass marketer on the planet, right? Everybody goes to Walmart except the people who, when I say, do you shop at Walmart? No one ever raises their hand, right? <laughs> Tons of people come in, huge market share. They dominate almost every category they're in. In fact, they sell 25% of the groceries in the United States. Think about it. From nothing to 25% of the groceries almost overnight. Clearly not going on the customer experience. Lots of niche brands out there. Whole Foods. I love Whole Foods. I just don't like to spend money at Whole Foods. <laughs> whole paycheck. There you go. A whole paycheck. That's pretty cute. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. That's from Jim Cramer. Ah, there you go. But the reality is that's a niche brand. They have some people that they will spend everything there, right? But they're also more likely to just spend part of their product there, part of their uh, wallet there. Then we have these conditional use brands. You know, there are some items that you just have to have. You know, my wife and I love Turkish food. Well, guess what? We're going to Turkish food stores to get them, right? You don't have an option. And yes, they're going to price even worse than Whole Foods because it's coming from Turkey. They know you can't get it anywhere else. 
Now, the funny thing is, if I have these mass market brands in my category, I can never have a high loyalty brand in my category. They're mutually exclusive. I will never have a group of people, uh, never have a large market share category where I have really high satisfaction. So let's think about these kinds of brands. Let's go back to our, uh, what kind of brand are you? We have these mass market brands in the burger restaurant category, right? We all know them. And then we have the ones that are unhealthy that I absolutely love, uh, particularly the smash burger. And I've been told that that's terrible to say that here on the, on the left coast because I was supposed to put an in and out burger or something there. Huh? Huh? Yeah, you poor, poor people. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's just enough reason to get on a plane and go to the East Coast, just for that burger. And you think I'm making this up. I was on a plane uh, last week coming back from Las Vegas, and I was sitting next to the CEO of the Swiss Army Com brand. They have a different name for it in India. And we literally talked for two hours about great American burgers and talked to him about Smash Burger. I talked about so much that he had a five-hour layover from Newark to go to, uh, back to Delhi, and he wanted to get a taxi to go to one of these places. And I said, you know, just come back. We'll do it with my wife. And so we ate there that weekend. I took a picture of my Smash Burger meal and sent it to him in India. And he goes, oh my god, I can't wait to go with you and your family. So it was the email back. It was, it was that kind of a conversation. Yes, it will kill you if you eat it every day. But, you know, at least you'll die with a smile on your face. And <laughs> now there are other brands, though, that are high loyalty brands. And they're almost always in the tech sector. Not, not always, but almost always in the tech sector. And you can think about your phone. Most of us in this room have some sort of smartphone. And if I was just to make a guess, you're going to either have a Samsung Galaxy or an iPhone. Maybe not. But that would be the guess if I was just going to do it based on how the market share split up. Now, you love that phone. You will talk to me about that phone all the time, especially if you're a Galaxy Android person and you're talking to the Apple person. Right? They'll just go at it on why I should be having this phone. And there's a funny thing about that, though. The reason it's a high loyalty brand is you actually haven't been able to habituate, as we say in marketing. You haven't been able to get used to this brand. Why? How many of you all have an original iPhone in your? Do you use that? How many of you use an iPhone 4? No, that, you use it. Oh my God, we have some Luddites in here. You know, that's actually supposed to be a paperweight. <laughs> There you go, right? But, 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 but it's funny because everybody laughs because they know that joke, right? My daughter, oh, not an iPhone 4. I can't have one of those. I don't even know what, I don't even know what the uh, features are that are so grand that she needs, you know, whatever the new one's going to be. But the reality is if at the Big Mac World Conference they come up and they announce a phone that's terrible, they will not be a high loyalty brand anymore they will become Blackberry, right? Because that's exactly what happens. As soon as you lose, you lose fast, and you become a phone that only people use because their company makes them use it. So all of these spaces are valid business strategies. You just have to know where you play. Now here's the part, though, that's really awful. And it's not so easy to get around because, as we showed earlier, managers believe that I get that higher satisfaction, I'm going to get higher customer spending, and that's going to re ultimately result in market share. And Lausanne has pretty much shown that conclusively not to happen. We're not going to tell you why that doesn't happen. It turns out that knowing your satisfaction level explains only 1% of the variation in how you divide your spending and the brands you use. By the way, that's useless. That's a number that no one in here would take to their manager and say, hey, my model has a 1% fit. To give you an idea, if we had 1% model fits to go to the moon, everyone would have died. Right? You don't build anything on that. Yet that's what we do every day. Because we ask these customer satisfaction surveys, we look at what we're supposed to do based on these surveys, and then we run off and spend money and wonder why we have a negative ROI, return on investment. Now what I love about this is how easy it has been to prove. 
And for those of you who are not business people, this is an Excel spreadsheet, or at least what it looks like. And all I have to have is I have to have the customer satisfaction level and the percentage of spending they give to my brand. Those, just those two variables. And I put them in a spreadsheet and I can calculate something called an R square and forgive the technical term, that just tells me how strong the fit is. How strong is that relationship? And you don't even have to be uh, a stat person. They actually have a formula in Excel that you just write in there and it'll tell you that. You get to the bottom and almost always it's about 1%. Now, managers challenge me all the time, and one of my favorite times was a very, very large hotel chain. You guys would definitely know it because it's named after a famous person. <laughs> so, and they, uh, the guy sitting there telling me, I know that's wrong, I just know you're wrong, I have the data right here. He's on the phone with me and he goes, okay, what do I do? I said, okay, you have their satisfaction level, put that in column A and put their share of spending with your brand in column B. And he goes, okay, what do I do? And I go, you go down to the bottom and you compute the R square. It's just equal RSQ, uh, parenthesis, and then put one column, comma, column two, and then close the parenthesis, and hit enter. And all I hear is, ah! <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> ah! He didn't even make 1%. <laughs> Didn't even make 1%. And I laughed. I, of course, I shouldn't have laughed. But I laughed. I was like, what did you expect? I told you, we do this all the time. It's always going to come out this way. And for those of us who are brand managers in this room, and I know we have one, <laughs> just do it. I promise you will come up with exactly this. You will never beat 5%. And I shouldn't say never, because it's theoretically possible. You definitely will never beat 10%. And no matter what, you still would never go to your boss and say, hey, I have a 9% model fit, right? Would that ever happen? No. <laughs> because the next words would be, you don't work here. <laughs> right? You don't work here anymore. So given that it's so easy to prove, why do managers believe that these things are related? Well, at a Jesuit institution, it's really easy, right? We want to believe. It's a part of the Jesuit ideal. The golden rule is all based on this. And by the way, I'm a big believer in the golden rule, and so is Lausanne, and that's the reason we want to make these things work. Because businesses are going to find a way to make money, and if we don't show them a way to make money where we make customers happy, well, they'll go with the Stephen Colbert line, right? <laughs> How do I make them get those numbers in the toilet and get that dollar up. But we also have consultants who go out there and I don't know that they're intentionally misleading. They may not know basic statistics. But they'll present very misleading averages that'll show you that very happy people spend more than very unhappy people. And I don't want to say those numbers are lying because I'm sure they're true. They're just irrelevant. Because anytime you have a positive relationship, even if it's 1%, you'll find that there's a difference. It's just not helpful. Now, let me give you an example so that it's really easy to understand why it's not helpful. Let's forget about satisfaction and spending, and let's think about how much you weigh and where you live. Now, you may not believe this, but there are really strong statistically significant differences between your weight and where you live in the country. Now you'll notice you live in California and the West Coast doesn't eat enough. <laughs> now, I am from the South. I grew up in Kentucky and Tennessee and, you know, we always say we're going to die happy because we eat really well there. You know, any place where you can actually bread and deep fry a steak, you know. <laughs> it, you know, this is, this is God's country. And uh, now, and we'll see God sooner than you will, too. So <laughs> now, I want you to imagine me walking up to one of you right now. You, sir, you look to be in great shape. I'm going to pick you. Yeah, right. right? Sure. Mark. Mark. Yes. Mark, great shape, much lower body weight average than normal, definitely from Colorado. Yeah. Where? 
And we can tell right now that Mark is not living up to his eating standards. <laughs> there you go, buddy. We've got to work on this. We'll get you back. We'll get you to a healthy size. You will look like our governor by the time we're done. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we need to come back and think about what does it actually mean to be average? What does it mean to be average? Now, are there some young single ladies here in this audience? I believe you must be, right? There you go. Let me show you what your future husband is going to look like. <laughs> I'm just going to use the average, okay? But since we're going to pick the most likely husband for you, this is it. No, no, don't laugh. This is truly the person. First of all, I, s I see your mother laughing. This is her future son-in-law. What is this about? <laughs> Hold on, you're going to like that. Because first of all, please go to Florida. Make sure you get a law degree. Because you're going to need to make some business and law. Great combination. <laughs> Just stay in school for a long time. Get some really awesome degrees. And then come out and make a lot of money. Because your future husband will be 28 years old. He's going to make less than $12,000 a year, but he will have a cell phone. No bank account. He's going to be relying on you. <laughs> now, why do you think that I'm kidding? This is real. That face is, is, is an amalgamation of like 700,000 people or something that National Ge Geographic did. And here, if you really want to wait, though, if you're willing to wait 15 years, that person will be Indian. So you can choose. <laughs> Just, to, you know. It's all going to work out. Sounds silly, right? Everyone here knows that that is really stupid, yet that is exactly what we're saying all the time when we say, oh, let's focus on these scores. Let's group people into these big buckets, and they're all going to behave the same way. No, no. We hate it when our mail doesn't even make sense, right? I hate getting something in there that says they clearly don't know who I am. It's all about finding out what individuals need. And that's really the key. And that's really what we're getting at with the wallet allocation rule. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Lerzon, who'll give you a cautionary tale from the world's largest employer. Which would be Walmart. <laughs> so I know we've mentioned Walmart a lot today. And it's not like we're picking on Walmart or anything. But they just you know, make a great example. So. Uh, the reason why we picked Walmart is because uh, it's a, an example of a cautionary tale. And back in 2008, during the recession, they were one of the companies that was doing really, really well. And uh, at the same time, when you look at their competitors, they were tanking. So Walmart took this opportunity and said, I am going to decimate my competition. How do I do that? When I look at what I'm not really good at, Walmart found out that it's really the customer experience that it lacks. So, and I think anyone who's been to a Walmart will know that it's not exactly the best customer experience. So um, they looked at survey research and found out that the number one complaint that customers had was the, again, the, the whole feeling of um, being in a warehouse and just not really feeling good when, when they're in the store. So as a result of this, Walmart decided to launch a new strategy, which they called Project Impact. Now, Project Impact, um, the goal was to clean up the aisles, make clutter much less, and make it much easier for the customer to find products within the store. And these are actually slides and pictures from the chief operating officer explaining exactly what Project Impact is going to do. So what happened? Customer satisfaction indeed soared. In fact, in Walmart's history, it was a time when it was the highest customer satisfaction that Walmart had ever experienced. Now, you might be wondering, how did this translate into financial performance? Well, that's actually where, where um, things go wrong. And um, in 2008, as you can see, they, Walmart started experiencing one of the greatest slides in same store sales uh, in the entire history of Walmart. So 
you may be skeptical and think that, well, there may be other things that are going on um, that are resulting in this decline, but actually the CEO himself and the executives of Walmart uh, came out and directly attributed this decline to project impact. So it's not just only me saying it. Um, uh, it's been said that Walmart lost about $2 billion as a result of project impact. I mean, can you imagine $2 billion? That is the revenue of a Fortune 500 company. So that's huge. And I'm going to show you a slide um, that I think is probably one of the worst quotes that you could hear from a CEO, especially for a customer experience program and rollout. And that's this. They loved the experience. They just bought less. <laughs> And that generally is not a good long-term strategy. So what's the solution to the problem that Tim has started talking about? The solution is to stop watching our satisfaction scores and start paying attention to our rank. Now, when we talk about rank and what we mean by rank, I just want to show you an example Imagine that you have two customers, Janet and John. And you ask them, how happy are you with us as a firm? Each of them gives you a 9 on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, when you look at a 9, 9 is not a bad score, right? A manager would look at that and say, hey, we're doing pretty well. But if I also ask Janet and John what other brands they are using in that same category, and ask them to rate those brands as well, now what do you think? Those two customers are not the same. They don't actually see us the same way. They don't like us equally. They're both giving us a nine, but for John, we are clearly his first choice. But for Janet, even with a nine, we're actually tied for last. And the reason why this is important is because knowing this enables you to understand why and how that customer allocates their spending. Remember Tim talked about that 1%, the variance explained? Well, if you actually look at rank, if you actually look at where your brand stands relative to the other brands that that customer is also using, you can explain much more variance, much more than 1% for sure. So that is what we mean by the wallet allocation rule. And that's the basis for <coughs> what we're talking about. If you know two things, the number of brands that your customer is using and the relative rank that that customer assigns to you across that portfolio, you can understand share of wallet and share of spending. And it was actually introduced in this formula in the Harvard Business Review that Tim talked about. It's actually a very simple formula when you look at it, right? Uh, although the editors of HBR didn't think so, they actually wrote a little caution at the top of this formula saying, don't let the math scare you. That's, that's not a joke. That's, that's true. Uh, but just looking at this formula, it's very clear how you can grow your business, right? You have to do one of two things or both. You either have to reduce the number of brands that your customer uses in a category, or you have to improve your relative rank in terms of satisfaction or NPS or whatever measure that you're using in the customer's mind. So those are really the two ways you can improve your, your share. Uh, we actually wanted to test whether wallet allocation rule, um, if we only knew those two things, the satisfaction and the, rel the, the number of brands and relative rank, would we actually be able to come close to the share of wallet that the customer actually allocates in reality? Um, and as you can see, over about 12 different industries, um, it comes really close. And these are just what we would call correlation. So closer to one means that those two things are really closely related. And the last thing we, we looked at was, if we are changing our strategy, um, so, and that's really the basis for many of the things we do as managers, right? We want to know that the changes we make now are going to pay off in the future. So does it really work? And the wallet allocation rule actually performs so much better than those metrics that companies use. Now you might be wondering, 
Um, well, that, that really isn't something that is surprising, right? Relative rank, number of brands. I mean, it sounds pretty intuitive. But the issue is that's not how managers actually track customer satisfaction or track net promoter scores. What they do is they only ask you how happy you are with them. They don't ask you whether you're using other brands. So even though this sounds um, intuitive and, and easy to understand, that's really not how managers currently manage their, their customer loyalty programs. Tim will close off with the good news and the bad news. Well, the good news, and there is some good news, and that is you know, we've heard a lot of us talk, a lot of talk about satisfaction doesn't work or net promoter doesn't work or whatever. It turns out we don't care what measure you use because they're all measuring the same thing. How strongly do I feel toward, positively do I feel toward this brand? And they all work really well in predicting rank. And if I use that rank from that, I can put that in that wallet allocation rule formula and link up. We actually didn't expect this to happen, but they all were virtually identical. And by the way, we've done lots more tests. We have a, we have a 10 country, 75,000 customer, 250,000 brand study that just came out uh, in the uh, Journal of Service Management literally a few days ago. It's a huge validation. So uh, we know this works. But there is some bad news. And that is what we're doing now in terms of just measuring satisfaction and trying to improve that. It can be a useful part of a company strategy, but it could also be a real disaster plan. Because it doesn't drive growth. And we're going to go back to the credit union example that, uh, that Lerzon talked about. This was the actual press release from the American Customer Satisfaction Index when the uh, when credit unions had set the all-time record high for satisfaction for any industry in the United States. And they basically were saying, this is going to make them huge. But I love the line in their, in their subtitle, small better than big. I mean, they didn't catch that the whole point of them being successful was their niche play. Now, what ends up happening if you just focus on satisfaction is you focus on the wrong thing. Because what drives satisfaction seldom drives your rank. So what's the biggest driver for satisfaction at a credit union? If I was to ask everyone, you know, how satisfied are you with a credit union, and then ask you a bunch of attributes and try to relate those attributes of your experience to satisfaction, what you'd find out is that the most important thing is how well you resolve complaints. It makes total sense, right? If you can get my complaints to go down, my satisfaction level will go up. I mean, that's so intuitive. So here's the basic question. How many of you all chose your bank because they were really good at solving problems they created for you? <laughs> I have a man over here who says, I picked my bank because they could solve their problems better. <laughs> my best friend's a banker, so. There you go. <laughs> Most of us aren't you. But that's OK. You are the 1%. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality is, if I looked at why people go to a credit union, and I checked to see what's driving their rank, it's real intuitive. They don't have any fees. They better not. They're nonprofits. And if you're a nonprofit, the whole point is to get the cost out of the system. So they pay higher interest rates, and they have lower fees. Think about it. I can go to an institution that's going to pay me, pay me more on my deposits, charge me lower interest rates on my loans, and give me no fees. Why would I go anywhere else? Why would I ever go anywhere else? It's funny because most credit union customers have a bank relationship. Why would you go? Well, why do they go? Well, Lerzon did this excellent study, uh, a big national study of credit union members. And so she looked at something like 5,500 credit union members. And it turns out that almost all of them have a bank relationship. And it turns out that if you just looked across the entire United States, that most of them tend to need a banking relationship because they actually need to be in the 21st century and to be able to bank online. 
And if you're a credit union, you're probably pretty small. And you probably don't have really good IT infrastructure to make really good internet banking services. So if you're a credit union and you want to grow share of deposits, you aren't going to do it by lowering your fees because you have nowhere to go unless you're planning to pay people to bank with you. You're going to have to reduce customers' perceived need to use the competition, which in this case, if you're just looking across the country, you're going to have to find a way to at least make them not have to need the banks for their online services. Now, if you eliminated that, you would still find access issues, right? B big banks have branches everywhere. Most credit unions don't. That doesn't mean all, but most don't. You're going to have to answer the need that these customers have, or you're going to stay where you are, regardless of your satisfaction level. So in conclusion, increasing satisfaction can be a useful component of your strategy, but it doesn't have to be. It's frequently a very bad idea. But with the wallet allocation rule, we can begin to understand why our customers are using us and the competition, and we can actually tie that back to share of wallet, which means we can tie it back to dollars. Because share of wallet is about how much am I spending of my wallet with my brand versus the competition. I now know the money that's going to my competitors and what it takes to get it. I always like to end this because I should be a rock star, and instead, I'm a market researcher. As I say, a frustrated musician who had to make a living, and my wife can tell you that I'm very serious about it. Her Christmas present was a bass guitar that she has to learn to play so we can play together. So, <laughs> you know, and, I, and, and what, the reason we're in this space is that we really do want to show businesses how to win by doing the right thing. You know, because if they don't win by doing the right thing, they will win some way. They have to. They, you know, their number one goal is survival. And I love the Rolling Stones. I should be playing with Keith, although probably don't want to look like Keith. But uh, not even back then. So this is the song we actually want our customers singing, although it's a really terrible one. I can get satisfaction. But I want it to make sense. I can get satisfaction, and I can have a hit for the business at the same time. And on that, Lerzon and I will close. Thanks very much, Lerzon and Tim. Thank you.